So, uh, continue our walk through the Psalms, and uh, the next Psalm that we're going to do is Psalm 51. But, you know, I was thinking about it, and you know, you know, as soon as I chose it, I was c confronted by a dilemma. It's like, man, do we just read the Psalm? And if we just read it and just walk through it, would we really be true to the context of, of the Scripture in doing that? And so, actually, I was laying in bed, and maybe I just do it, do it, do it. You know what? Ultimately, I came to the conclusion that to really understand the depth of this song, what led to its writing, to really understand the gravity of David's sin, how it impacted him and the lives of others, to understand the brokenness of David, and then to experience the goodness and mercy of God, we need to examine everything, all the events, and everything that led up to the writing of the song. We need to understand the terrible depths of David's sin. To see how David fell as a leader, how he fell as a man, how he abused his authority and power as king, and how he took what was not his, how he conspired to hire, hide his actions, how he murdered a righteous man, and how he justified his actions and how he continued in his deception until confronted by God. You know, when we present David in these terms, he sounds like one of the most wicked men in the Bible. There are a lot of wicked men in the Bible. And you know what? For this moment in time, he was. For this moment in time. And yet, God called David a man out. And he chose him to be king of Israel, but not just the king of Israel, but the lineage to the Messiah, right? This guy. So let's go to 2 Samuel chapter 11. So we're going to be covering two chapters, and we're just kind of walk through it slowly but surely here. So starting with verse 1, it happened in the spring of the year. At the time when kings go out to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him, and all Israel. And they destroyed the people of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. But David remained in Jerusalem. So it starts off in the spring when kings go out to battle. And when I thought, just this one little verse right there, I go, you ever seen, uh, actually they have it, World War II in color now, right? Where you can watch World War II in color. And you ever seen... When the Germans attempt to invade Russia in the siege of like Leningrad in the winter, right? It is brutal, absolutely brutal. Now, in the case of David, in this time, it's actually seasonal rains that what they're avoiding. So who wants to go to battle in a mudder, right? You're not going to do that. So what? They waited to the spring to do this. But David did something. He sent Joab, and he remained in Jerusalem. And Joab does what? He goes out and defeats these guys. <laughs> but it says when kings go out to battle, and Joab is not the king. Right? He's not the king. David has delegated his responsibility of leadership to Joab. Now, delegation has its place. We see this in Exodus with Moses, right? There were so many people, and he was trying to judge all the rights and wrongs of the people. He couldn't do it, so what? he brought in people to help him do that. And a good leader knows when to delegate, how to delegate, and very importantly, whom to delegate. But just as importantly, a good leader knows when not to delegate. That things should not be delegated to someone else. And by the way, this is true for all of us. There are times when the mantle of responsibility rests solely on our shoulders. It doesn't belong to anybody else. It belongs to me. It belongs to me. And this was one of those times for David. David had no idea how much this <coughs> ill-fated decision would have set off a chain of events that would cost him and others dearly and haunt him the rest of his life. Joab and his servants did as they were commanded because who's going to argue with the king? 
verse 2 through 5. Then it happened one evening that David arose from his bed and walked on the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful to behold. So David sent and inquired about the woman. And someone said, Is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Then David sent messengers and took her, and she came to him. And he lay with her, for she was cleansed from her impurity, and she returned to his, her house. And then the woman conceived, so she sent and told David and said, I am with child. So David gets up one evening, he's walking on the roof of the king's house. Hold that thought, the roof of the king's house, that's important. And he saw a woman bathing, the she, she was beautiful. And he asked about this woman, right? The she, the wife of Uriah. So he sent messengers, they took her, and she came to him. Because who's going to argue with the king? Right? He laid with her, and a woman can see, I am a child. The she was pregnant. Some thoughts about this are really, really obvious, right? First of all, David wasn't supposed to be in Jerusalem to begin with. He was supposed to be with his people in war. He saw the woman bathing. That's when he should have left the roof. He should have done what Joseph did with Potiphar's wife. He should have put on his holy track shoes and ran out. <laughs> so he committed adultery with your rights. So the one thing that strikes me more than anything else about this, you know, we have the sin of adultery here. There's no question that that's the case, right? But really the thing that strikes me the most is this is abuse of power here. This abuse of power. Because it, said, it didn't say David's roof, did it? It said the king's roof. It's the king's roof. It's authority. So why did he do it? Because he could. Because he could. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. And with authority comes the responsibility to wield it rightly. But who could argue with the king? Verse 6. Then David sent to Joab, saying, Send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab <clears throat> sent Uriah to David. When Uriah had come to him, David asked how Joab was doing, and how the people were doing, and how the war <clears throat> prospered. And David said to Uriah, Go down to your house and wash your feet. So Uriah departed from the king's house. And a gift of food from the king followed him. But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his lord, and did not go down to his house. So then when they told David, Uriah did not go down to the house, David said to Uriah, Did you not come from a journey? Why did you not go down to your house? And Uriah said to David, The ark in Israel and Judah are dwelling in tents, my lord Joab and the servants of my lord are encamped in the open fields. Shall I then go to my house and eat and drink and lie with my wife? As you live, as your soul lives, I will not do this thing. <clears throat> then David said to Uriah, Wait here today also and tomorrow. I will not let you depart. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next. Now when David called him, he ate and drank before him. He made him drunk. And at evening he went out to lie on his bed with the servants of his Lord. He did not go down to his house. Send me Uriah the Hittite. So David calls Uriah back from the battlefield. Right? And what's interesting is he talks with Uriah. How's everything going? Well, David already knew how everything was going. They had messengers going back and forth all the time. This was small talk. That's what this was. He's setting Uriah up. He's trying to soften him at this point in time. And it's manipulation. It is pure manipulation. Go down to your house, rest, wash your feet, go home and relax and kick back for a while. But Uriah slept at the king's door and did not go down. And David was amazed, right? Said, Why did you not go down to your house? And I love verse 11. Because this is one of the most no noble and honorable statements made in Scripture. Uriah is speaking. And Uriah said to David, 
The ark and Israel and Judah are dwelling in tents, and my Lord Joab and the servants of my Lord are encamped in open field. Shall I then go to my house to eat and drink, to lie with my wife? As you live, and as your soul lives, I will not do this thing. This is a man you want in your corner. A guy like this. This is a man you want to go to battle with. <clears throat> but David is so consumed with this cover-up, he can't see it. He just can't see it. He's unmoved by the loyalty of Uriah, this honorable man. And actually, Uriah is more honorable than David. More honorable than David. <clears throat> but David is not to be deterred. He says, what? Wait here today. You can leave tomorrow. Because David's not done yet. What does he do? He feeds him. He gets him drunk. But what? Uriah doesn't go down. He doesn't go. The cover-up has failed. Verse 14. In the morning, it happened that David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. And he wrote in the letter saying, Set Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle and retreat from him that he may be struck down and die. So it was while Joab besieged the city that he signed Uriah to a place where he knew there were valiant men. Then the men of the city came out and fought with Joab. And some of the people, the servants of David, fell. And Uriah the Hittite died also. So David writes a letter, and he actually gives it to Joab to deliver, to Uriah to deliver to Joab, right? So he sends us. What Uriah doesn't know that literally that letter is his death sentence. That's what he's being told. He has no idea what's in that contents of that letter. But it's his death sentence. And David wrote, Set Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle and retreat from him that he may be struck down and die. David ordered Joab to put Uriah in the heat of the battle, desert him so he can be killed. You know, this is like despicable and beyond the pill. I mean, who would really, really do something like that? I mean, it's hard to imagine the lengths that David is going through to protect himself. Self-preservation has an incredible capacity to blind. Self-preservation will have us do things we would not normally do. We would not. Right? Do not be surprised of what we are capable of doing for the sake of protecting ourselves. And then, the men of the city came out and fought with Joab. And some of the people of the servants of David fell. And Uriah the Hittite died also. Because who can argue with the king? Verse 18. Then Joab sent and told David all the things concerning the war. And he charged the messenger, saying, When you have finished telling the matters of the war to the king, if it happens that the king wrath arises, and he says to you, Why did you approach so near to the city when you fought? Do you not know that they would shoot from the wall? Who struck Abimelech, the son of Jerusha? Was it not a woman who cast a piece of millstone on him from the wall, so he died in Tibet? Why did you go near the wall? Then you shall say, Your servant, Uriah the Hittite, is dead also. <coughs> so the messenger went and came and told David all that Job had sent. Sit by him. And the messenger said to David, Surely the men prevailed against us and came out to us in the field. Then we drove him back as far as to the entrance of the gate. The archers shot down from the wall at your servants, and some of the king's servants are dead. And your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. So now David's notified, and actually this is really interesting, we're talking about if the king does these things, if he were to do these things, he would be feigning it anyway. He would be feigning it. It wouldn't be reality. David knows the truth. David knows what's going to happen. He already knows that, right? But the results David was seeking have been achieved. Mission accomplished for David. The secret remains safe. Verse then David said to the messenger, Thus shall you say, shall say to Joab, Do not let this thing displease you. 
for the sword devours one as well as another. Strengthen your attack against the city and overthrow it so we encourage you. So this is really David's very weak attempt to let Joab know that everything's okay. Don't worry about this, Joab, because when you decided to be a soldier, you're going to probably die in battle anyways. That's what he's saying. But I tell you, justification, especially self-justification, can be just as disturbing as anything that we do. And that's what David's doing here. He's justifying the actions. And anytime we look to justify our actions, we need to take a very serious look at our motivations, why we're justifying ourselves. I think usually we'll find we're again attempting to defend ourselves. We don't really need to do that. Soon, as soon as I start justifying myself. And then I think, and I thought, how did Joab feel? Right? You don't really get his thoughts at all in this. You don't. How did he feel? I mean, he had been in battle with Uriah. They were side by side fighting together. They were comrades in arms, right? You know, and I got it. And, and you know what? Joab knew Uriah's worth. He knew what kind of man Uriah was. And you know, you got to believe that this didn't really sit very well with Joab. But who can argue with the king? Verse 26. When the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead, she mourned for her husband. And when the mourning was over, David sent and brought her to his house. And she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. So when Bathsheba heard that her husband was dead, she mourned, right? And, and this, is, this is important, the way it's said at this time. said, when the wife of Uriah, the wife, because what? It's Uriah's wife, it's not David's. It's Uriah's wife, right? When her mourning was over, David sent for her, and he became her wife, and and then the baby was born, right? And I'm thinking, I'm not sure how much joy they had in this birth. You know, because usually when a baby is born, and it's a joyous time. Because everything around this birth is deceitful and tragic. You know, but she, but she's probably not aware of David's diabolical plans to cover this thing. You're not regarding, right? The deception and murder. The only thing actually Bathsheba knows, when we look at the scriptures, what? She lost her husband, and she was married to the king, and had his child. Who can argue with the king? The thing that David had done displeased the Lord. There is one who can argue with. Chapter 12, 1 through 4. Then the Lord sent Nathan to David. And he came to him and said to him, There were two men in one city, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had exceedingly many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb, which he had bought and nourished, and grew up together with him and his, with his children. And it ate of his own food and drank from his own cup and lay in his bosom. It was like a daughter to him. I'm going to stop there. Just because if anybody owns the pet, really? I mean, we just lost ours. I mean, it killed us. It's just, you hold that pet, you just love him, man. Just love him. That's he, this lamb was his pet. And the traveler came to the rich man, who refused to take from his own flock and from his own herd to prepare one for the wayfaring man who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. So the Lord sent Nathan, and Nathan tells one the poor man's lamb story. And that's what we have here. And then verses 7 9. Then, sorry, excuse me, 5 and 6. So David's anger was greatly aroused against the man, and he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this shall surely die, and he shall restore fourfold for the lamb because he did this thing, because he had no pity. 
And by the way, David's response here is totally appropriate for the story. It's the right response, right? But what David didn't know, that Nathan said to David, you are the man. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel. I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your keeping and gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if that had been too little, I would have also given you much more. So Nathan, and it's really God saying this, says to David, you are the man. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I anointed you a king over Israel. I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house. I gave you the house of Israel and Judah. I would have also given you so much more. Why have you despised the commandment of the Lord? You have killed Uriah the Hittite. You have taken his wife. You have killed him. So God, through Nathan, does what? He confronts David. And does it? He says, I have done all these things for you. I could have given you so much more. And he speaks to this disobedience. Murder, the fifth commandment. Adultery. The sixth commandment. And by the way, he didn't, he didn't mean to speak to the other sins, because there are other sins. You've got the abuse of power. You've got deception. You've got justification. Those are sins, too. You don't got to talk about those when the penalty for murder and adultery is death. Those are minor details. Verses 13. So David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, The Lord has put away your sin. You shall not die. However, because by this deed, you have given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child also who is born to you shall surely die. Then Nathan departed to his house. So David confesses his sin. He says, I have sinned against the Lord. I, I, I did ask this question, though, and this question occurred to me. Did he confess it because he got caught? Because that's usually when we admit to something, right? We admit to something when we get caught. David got caught. You know, probably. And how long would David kept this deception had not Nathan confronted him? How long would he have done that? It's a hypothetical question. <clears throat> But usually, usually there's more hidden than revealed. Numbers 32, 23. You have sinned against the Lord. Be sure your sin will find you out. We, all of us, like David, have sinned against the Lord. And sin will always find us out. If not today, then tomorrow. And by the way, in whatever form that might take, sin always finds us out. And you know what? We're always confronted. As Nathan confronted David, we're always confronted. Conviction. It's the Holy Spirit. We always have a confrontation with our sin. The Holy, if you're a believer, you know when you're sitting. You know when you got the Holy Spirit He's telling you, I'm not doing that, right? And God doesn't need to send a Nathan to confront our sin, but he does when it's required. He does when it's required. I always know this is it, 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 when God does this, it is His truth that makes us free. This is why He does this. Right? But Nathan tells David that the Lord has put away sin. God has forgiven him. Why has God forgiven him? God loves David. He chose David, right? And he was not going to allow David to stay under this deception and everything that came with it. God wanted. David's whole heart. He wanted all of it. And as long as this thing remained there, he couldn't have all of it. He couldn't. And that's true for us. He wants all of us, right? Romans 2, 4, it is the goodness, it is the goodness of God that leads you to repentance. I always find that like that whenever you start teaching on repentance, it always seems like a heavy, right? It's kind of a heavy thing. Well, while you're dealing with sin, that's heavy. But the act 
act of repentance is an act of God. The act of repentance is an act of God. We would not repent of anything that God by His Spirit did not lead us into and give us the ability to repent. You have no capacity to repent apart from God. No ability to repent. This is a gift from God. Repentance is one of the greatest gifts we have from God. It's not something we need to shy away from. It's something we need to run to. And in it, an essential element is grace towards us. That he would do this. God loves you. He wants all of us, right? That's why he's given us this gift. But when we have sin, he says, come to me. Come to me. He doesn't want you far away. He wants us near. What an incredible gift repentance is. It is a gift of God. The consequence of sin. The gravity of David's sin begets grave consequences. The sword shall never depart from your house. I will raise up an adversary from your house. That would be Absalom. I will take your wives. This is cruel, practically, right? But you see, this is a heavy. I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor. And he will lie with your wives in the light of the sun. And if you didn't think you could get any, any worse than that, the child who is born to you shall surely die. You know, sometimes, and we've heard this said, that we believe that all sin is the same in the eyes of God. And in this, this sense, it's true that all sins need to be forgiven, and that forgiveness only comes through the shedding of blood. And for us, the person of Jesus Christ, that is how sin can be seen as the same. But some sin has more gravity than others. There are some very serious sins and consequences and an impact of the lives of other people, and even in the eyes of God. You know, David said adultery and murder would have required his life according to the law, right? And even Jesus said, when you look at the law, God has different judgments for different sins. It's weighed. He weighs these things. And, and adultery and murder are on the heavy, right? And even Jesus says, Who, but whoever causes one of these little ones to believe, who believe in me to sin, it would be better... <coughs> For him, if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depth of the sea. You know, Cynthia shared this with me a while back on this particular scripture that this is mercy. It's better for him to have a millstone around his neck. It's better. Here is a sin against a child, a sin against the child of God. This is grave in God's heart and grave in God's mind. I was a uh, uh, chaplain at Placer County Jail for about 10 years. And the uh, the first tank I had was called F-Tank. And F-Tank was, uh, these guys were mentally ill. They call them 5150s. That's like the penal code for you know being mentally ill in California. And I preferred that they stay on their meds when I talked there. They were a little bit more lucid. <laughs> okay. And so they weren't staying on meds. They'd get a little goofy there, right? So, But I was there for about a year. And then they moved me to J-Tank. The J-Tank. J-Tank was protective custody. That's where they sent the snitches. That's where the snitches went. But that's also where the sexual offenders went. And I was in that tank for almost 10 years, going every Friday night and, and teaching a Bible study. Every Friday night I'd go in there. <coughs> and the crimes were various. And the crimes were grave. In fact, I was in there for a number of times, and literally, literally a guy that I had gone to church with in a pre actually Calvary Chapel Arbor, he shows up in there. I had no idea. I had no idea. He was on his third strike. It's 25 plus. Three strikes. You know, even, even the incarcerated despises the child more. Even the incarcerated despise the child molester. There are some sins that are graver than other sins. And this is one of them. You know what's really cool about that, though? Man, some of these guys got saved. And that sin is forgiven. That sin is forgiven. 
I'm not so sure I want them released to the public, but I want them to have heaven. And I fell in love with these guys. I have you have. I fell in love with these guys. Some sins are more graver than others. So then Nathan departed from his house. You know, this is another thing. Nathan was chosen by God to what? To confront, to confront David. And you know, it is never easy being the person God has called to confront someone regarding sin. It is never easy to be that person. In fact, if you think you are that person, boy, I hope you're praying. Because you've got to be right on this one. You can't be wrong on this one. You've got to be right, right? Pray, write motivations, and always speaking the truth in love. Galatians 6, 1. Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. And the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife bore to David, and it became ill. Therefore David pleaded with God for the child, and David fasted and went in and lay on the ground, all night on the ground. So God strikes the child, Right, and David does what? He pleads for the child's life, because what else can he do? There's nothing else that David can do right here. His sin and his failure has brought him right to this point. This child is sick. Our sin and our failure. This is the only thing we can do. Go to God and ask for His mercy. Right. Hebrews 16.4 Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain help, uh, mercy, and find grace, and to help in time of need. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And this is a time of need. Verse 18 Then on the seventh day it came to pass that the child died, and the servants of David were afraid to tell him that the child was dead. For they said, Indeed, while the child was alive, we spoke to him, and we, he would not heed our voice. How can we tell him that the child is dead? He may do some harm. When David saw that his servants were whispering, David perceived that the child was dead. Therefore David said to his servants, Is the child dead? And they said, He is dead. So David arose from the ground, washed and anointed himself, and changed his clothes. And he went into the house of the Lord and worshipped. And then he went to his own house. And when he requested, they set food before him and he ate. Then the servant said to him, What is this that you have done? You have fasted and wept for the child while he was alive. But when the child died, you arose and ate food. And he said, While the child was alive, I fasted and wept for I said, Who can tell whether the Lord will be gracious to me that the child may live? But now he is dead. Why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he shall never return to me. So David, with his servants, is the child dead? He is dead. David does what? He rises from the ground. He washes and anoints himself. Changes his clothes. And then he went to the house of the Lord to worship God. And then he went to his own house and he ate. And the servants go, why are you doing this? And David said, hey, while the child was alive, I beseeched God for his life. Because who knows what God would do, right? Now he's dead. There's nothing left to do. Nothing left to do. And then he says, I shall go to him but he shall not return to me. Because David knew this one thing. He would see him in heaven. He knew this. Right? And that is hope for all of us, actually. Really what I saw here, really more than anything else in the actions of David, you know what? The child has died and there's no bringing him back. Life goes on. And the consequences for David's failure running their course and life goes on 
And no matter what we go through, life goes on. Man, you go to that dark time, that dark moment, the loss of a loved one, maybe a grave sin, whatever it is, whatever you go through, this we know to be true. Life goes on. If you know anything about the incarcerated, they're in there, and everything outside is still going on. The world, the world, this earth, our lives, it doesn't stop for anybody. It doesn't stop for a pain. It doesn't stop for anything, right? Oswald Chambers said this. When you have no vision from God, no enthusiasm left in your life, and no one watching you and encouraging you, it requires the grace of Almighty God to take the next step in your devotion to Him. In the reading and the studying of His Word, in your family's life, in your duty to Him. David took that next step. What did he do? He started by doing ordinary things. He got up, washed, and changed his clothes, right? And then what did he do then after that? What? He went to the house of the Lord and worshipped. And then what did he do then? Very ordinary thing. He went home and he ate. <clears throat> Note uh, that he went to the house of the Lord before he went to his house. He went more to God. Chambers again. Trust God and do the next day. You know, when you wish life could stop and, and you're going through it and you're hurting for whatever reason, whatever reason, do the next day. They're ordinary things usually. It's like making the bed or doing the dishes. You don't feel like doing anything because you're hurting and depressed for whatever reason. Just do the next thing. Put that one foot ahead of the other. You know what? And it takes time. It's not an overnighter for our pain. It was an overnighter for David, but he took the next step. He did the next thing. Verses 24, Then David comforted Bathsheba, his wife, and went into her and lay with her. So she bore a son and called his name Solomon. Now the Lord loved him, and he sent word by hand of Nathan, the prophet. So he called his name Jedidiah because of the Lord. So David comforts Bathsheba. No, by the way, no longer referred to as your wife's wife. Why? David, right? They have a child and they name him Solomon. And the Lord loved him. Speaking of Solomon specifically. And then the Lord sent a word by way of Nathan again. Because of the Lord, he named him Jedidiah, which means he loved of the Lord. So the story kind of ends here on a relatively soft note, right? That, that Solomon is born, and, 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 and Solomon will have his own story, too. Have his own story, too. And the baby's born, and, you know, life is going on. But you know what? I don't think we can call this a happy ending. I don't think we can call this a happy ending. Because this is a tragic story on every level. The Sheba was violated. Uriah and the baby are dead. And David will have to live with these choices and these consequences the rest of his life. Yet, God put away David's sin. And what? David begins trusting God again. And God has bestowed his love on this newborn child who again has his own story. As he said in the beginning, David failed as a leader. He felt as a man, he abused his authority and power as king, he took what was not his, he conspired to hire his act, hide his actions, he murdered a righteous man, he justified his actions, and he continued his deception until confronted by God. When confronted by the Lord, the accusation was, you are the man. And the last thing any of us ever want to hear is that you are the man. But sometimes that's exactly who we are. We are that man. Right? And David's sin, his decisions, his choices, what they do? They spilled into other people's lives and made a mess of everything. His messengers, listen, his messengers were used as tools for the adultery and the murder of Uriah. Joab 
was ordered to participate in the killing of Uriah, making him complicit in murder, right? And the tragedy of Bathsheba, who I don't know if we give her enough attention in this story. Why? Because consider her. Consider Bathsheba through this. She was forced to commit adultery and became pregnant. Her husband was murdered and her baby was taken from her. While the focus might is on David in this whole story, I can hardly imagine a worse life experience than what Bathsheba went through here. I mean, just think about it. Just think what she went through, right? And you know what? Our sin, our choices, is still in the lives of other people, and sometimes with tragic consequences. And sometimes, and I think most of us know this is true, these consequences stay with us for a lifetime. They'll always be there. You know, here's, here's a real simple one. If you've ever been a convicted of a felony, every time, every application you ever fill out, everyone, have you ever been convicted of a felony? That's it. The rest of your life, you have to fill out that form. So David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, the Lord also has put away your sin. You shall not die. 1 John 8 through 10. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Confession is the first step in re-engagement with God. 2 Corinthians 7, 9 through 10. Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that your sorrow led to repentance. For you were made sorry in a godly manner, that you might suffer loss from us in nothing. For godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation, not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. And then Luke 15, 7 through 10. I say to you likewise, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. Or what woman having 10 silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp, sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it. And when she has found it, she calls her friends and neighbors saying, rejoice with me. For I have found the peace which I lost. Likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of angels of God over one sinner who repents. My brother, my good friend and Lord, Pastor Donald, i got three pastors in my life. One of them is sitting back there. The other one's Chuck Dallas, Church of God, and, and Don Thomas. And Don Thomas said this, We have no compelling reason to sin. No compelling reason to sin. And he's right. We don't. We have no compelling reason to sin. But until we are delivered, fully delivered from this body of flesh, we will. And nobody knows this more than God. Nobody knows this more than God. And in his wisdom and by his grace, he has given us the gift of repentance. It is a gift, saints. And don't see it any other way. God has given us full access to him in our failure. Let's go to uh, Luke chapter 7, verse 37. Almost done. Hang on. And behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of fragrant oil, and stood at his feet behind him weeping. And she began to wash his feet with her tears, and wiped it with the hair of her head. And she kissed his feet, and anointed them with the fragrant oil. Now when the Pharisee who invited him saw this, he spoke to himself, saying, 
This man, if he were a prophet, would he know who and of what manner of this woman is who is touching him? For she is a sinner. And Jesus answered and answered and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. Teacher said, there was a certain creditor who had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii, the other 50. And when they had nothing of which to repay, he freely forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him more? Simon answered and said, I suppose one whom he forgave more. And he said to him, You have rightly judged. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered into your house, and you gave me no water for my feet. But she has washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. You gave me no kiss, but this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since the time I came in. You did not anoint my head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. Therefore, I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. Then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. To those who are forgiven much, loved much. And I think David found this out. I think David found this out. You know, we're all at different places in regards to the gravity of our sin and our sin and how we've handled them and our consequences and but we're, we're all in this place, the same place, in regard to our position to sin. The day you receive Jesus Christ, he put away your sin. Hebrews 10, 12 through 17. I love this. But this man, Jesus, but this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God, from that time waiting till his enemies are made his footstool. For by one offering... He has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. That's you. He has perfected you forever. Forever. But the Holy Spirit also witnesses to us after he had said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds I will write them. And listen to this. Then he adds, their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Forget them. As far as the east is from the west, so far he has removed our transgressions from us. Forgiven. Saints, we do not come to God to be forgiven. We come to God because we are forgiven. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. We're going to do communion. I can't think of a better time and a better scripture for that. It's going to come up and the worship team will do this on you.
received from the Lord, which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed <clears throat> took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant. The new covenant. In my blood. This too, as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We take the bread, the body of Christ. By his stripes we are healed. And the cup of his blood through whom we're cleansed completely our sins and our lawless deeds to remember no more. Praise the Lord. Take the cup. Thank you. 
Tuesday, Monday prayer, Monday night, tomorrow night prayer, five, what, 4 p.m. now, guys? Four, and then Wednesday night service. God Exodus, bless you all. Still next is, and then next Sunday. And then uh, all you football fans, go have fun. <laughs>